Thank you, Janara. So we begin our Lenten journey, and what shall we sing? Uh, you just know the name of the tune. Southwell. Which is... Da 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 um, I'm looking at the, not all the bird um, beasts, but that's not what we're singing. Oh, Christ, you walk the road. Yes, that's 424. That's there we go. 424. We speak different jargons, George, Laura, and I, but we'll get you there eventually. 424. Oh, that is a beautiful Lenten, uh, Lenten hymn. Let's sing the uh, let's sing the first two stanzas. So it's about the uh, three temptations of Jesus. But <clears throat> let's pick up the uh, first two stanzas. Him four two four. upon this also your confession. I, as a servant of God, your pastor, I give to you the gift of Jesus himself. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our scripture is on the back of the bulletin. If you've got an eagle eye, you can uh, read along with our two Arlenes. First, the Missouri Arlene. giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit on the ground, which your harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make <coughs> his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering of Ramian was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm with great deeds of terror, with sights and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us his land. 
a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Our second, I want to say Ohio, is that right? Or is it Illinois? Illinois. Illinois, or Illinois, formerly Illinois, Arlene. Thank you, Paul's words. Uh, the epistle is from Romans 10, 18 to 13. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Let's stand as Abel rejoicing in our Lord's victory for us as told here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And Jesus ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let's speak our faith in the uh, Satan Crusher, our Lord Jesus. We have here the Nicene Creed on our worship page. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God, God, life, life.
those of you who are, I need my two cents later. Okay. For those of you who are uh, guests, I'll try to stand here. So if you've got to move so these pillars aren't in your way, I'm sorry about that. So there are many ways to describe why Jesus came into this world. We're most familiar with describing his relationship to us. He came to rescue the sinners. We could also describe him in relationship to the Father. He came to serve his Father to do this great work of love. Another way to describe it is in relationship to the enemy. Look how it's said in John's first letter in chapter 3. It says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So you have there both Jesus' identity, Son of God, and his purpose. This is his mission. I will destroy the devil's work. This first Sunday of Lent, we see it starting to come true. Our text in the Gospel starts by saying, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, where did he get all that spirit from? Returned from the Jordan River. What just happened? Baptism. Baptism. Same way we get the spirit, right? The Spirit has now charged him up for his great mission. He's going to go on to a fabulous victory. Surprise, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness, this wasteland, this deadly place. And for 40 days, all that time tempted by the devil. Now maybe we can relate to that. At times, temptation falls hard, I think, on all of us one way or another. We get tempted. I wonder if we can really equate it to what happens with Jesus. Three times Satan attacks Jesus' identity. Verse 3, if you are the Son of God, if it's true who you think you are, again in verse 6, if you really want to be the king over all these kingdoms, and again in verse 9, if you are the Son of God. So these temptations are, prove it. <laughs> if you are who you are, say you are, let's see it. Show me some divine power. Decide like you are God, the Son of God. Jesus, however, is very sure of his identity. Again, in his own baptism, he heard that fabulous voice of the Father, you are my son, the one I love. With you I am well pleased. So now Jesus answers the enemy saying, it's because I am God's son. I know who I am. I have nothing to prove to you. I know my identity and here is my purpose, he says. I will fight you but not as you want with my divine power. I'm not going to use my godly wisdom. I mean, in a way, it seems kind of like a silly matchup. What chance does the devil have against the Son of God? I mean, Jesus asks us to say, poof, and he's gone, and he's toast forever. But Jesus doesn't do that. I have a different purpose here. I will fight you with the very weapon that God gave to man. It is written, Jesus keeps saying. This is the word that God gave to us people. I will beat you, devil, as a human. I will do it for the humans. So secure in his identity. What does it have to do with us? Would the devil really attack us in a similar way and say, you really think you're God's child? Have you paid any attention to what happened to you in your life? These disasters that befall you, is that the way God would treat his kids? Or else he gets even slicker. He says, you think you're God's child after what you did? How could God possibly be pleased with you? You're not part of his family. How do we fight against the devil when he attacks our identity? Usually when people fight, Carolyn, I'm not going to fight you, but when 
when people fight, whether it's in the West, we call it boxing, where if I throw a punch, she throws a counterpunch. It's one attack is met by an equal and opposite force. So in the East, it's something like karate. You attack this way, then you attack back that way, your opponent does. <laughs> if we're going to fight the devil like that when he throws these accusations against us, can we really stand our ground and fight him off on our own two feet? I think you're not going to have much success. And I got interested in that concept when I was reading a, a scriptural author talking about jujitsu. It's another kind of oriental combat where instead of meeting your opponent's force with equal force, you receive his force. Ju means gently or yielding. And you take it and direct it towards the ground. Or in our case, we take the enemy's accusation and we direct it, not down, but we direct it up to the one who fights for us. Okay, maybe I'm being a little uh, obscure here. But it's a very clear concept. When the devil says to you, what makes you think you're God's kid? We can't stand on our own and fight that off and prove it that we're God's kid. What we can do is gently receive that jab and say, oh, that's a very good question, Mr. Devil, sir. So tell me, who decides who are God's kids? Well, there's an idea. Let's go ask the Father. So tell me, Papa, am I yours? Did you send your son into this world for me? Did he make me part of the family? Tell me, Papa. The enemy wants to know. When I was baptized, did you adopt me into your family or not? <clears throat> when you called me to the table to receive Jesus and his body and blood, is it true that I was part of the family feast? Am I really your child? The enemy wants to know. Tell me. Father, I do not trust my own opinions. When he said, I'm forgiven, is it true? Show me, Father, where it is written. Because Papa, on my own, I cannot beat him. The enemy is stronger than me. For me, did Jesus beat the devil? Or didn't he? <laughs> and the enemy's mouth is stopped. The devil always delights to attack our identity. You think you're God's kid, prove it. Because <laughs> if he can throw us off our identity, then we've lost the Father's purpose in this world. And that comes in all kinds of ways, just like it did for Jesus. Sometimes it's in the desert, this wilderness wasteland. We feel like our life is so hard. And it can be, can't it? When we feel alone, when we are hurt, when we're throwing up prayers and we're feeling like there's no help, it's a wasteland. And the enemy pretends to be a friend and says, you know what? Maybe now you just have to make yourself happy. Turn lemons into lemonade. Turn stone into bread. Well, that's what he told Jesus. He's never, he's never tempted me that way. I don't know about you. <laughs> I'm not going to try that one. We'll sell out for so much less. You just got to cut some corners. Make yourself happy. How do we answer that one? Remember who you are. <laughs> Wait a second. I don't like where my life is now, but I still am God's child. He made me his own. And I'm happy what God has written, that my life does not depend on bread alone. It's not about how much stuff I have or don't have. It's not about how hungry I am. 
If you look at Jesus' life, it's not like he came out of this wilderness and from then on he was never hungry. The entire experience of his ministry is he was hungry. He was starving. Even on his cross, he's still crying out, I thirst. Give me a drink, somebody. He needs to wet his vocal cords so that he can shout that out in triumph. It's finished. I'm hungry for this world to receive me. And now I have done everything that they can have the feast. When we get stuck in the wilderness, when our, when our life feels like such a wasteland, that's our opportunity to admit it. I am hungry, Lord. Make me hungry, not just for more bread, not just for an end to my troubles. Let this hunger, Lord, drive me to you. Let me be hungry, Lord, for you, the giver of every good gift. The devil's sneaky. If he can't get you when you're low, he'll try to get you when you're high, up on the mountaintop, when life is fabulous. Everything's going your way. All the world, whatever you want, any power, any glory, any joy, just grasp it. To Jesus, he says, I'll give everything to you. We people have a tendency to sell out for a lot less. All it takes is one red cent to obscure your vision. And all of a sudden, you don't have any depth perception anymore. You can't tell what's right and what's close to your heart and what's wrong and should be shoved away. <laughs> Two pennies, and now you can't see anything. What do you call a guy who's there completely at rest with his two cents resting on his eyelids? Dead, dead. I call him a corpse, yep. <laughs> You've seen that picture. If you say to God, I've got everything I want. What do I need you for? Does that mean God is going dead? Or is it your own heart that has stopped? Don't let it happen, Papa. I am your child. Let me hear where it's written. You only will I worship. You only will I serve. We so often trip up on this stuff. You know, We get satisfied and we forget to be hungry for God. But Jesus, he's always hungry always eager to worship with everything he's got, crying out, Father, forgive them. You have to, because there's nobody else like you that can do it. Father, forgive. You have sent me with my own blood to serve you. <coughs> Remember your identity and your purpose becomes clear, even on the mountaintop. Wonderful place to be where everything's going your way. Even there can you say, Lord, I am so rich. Let me see it coming from your hand, that my heart is set free to worship you. Lord, you are so rich. You've been so generous to me. Make me to be like you, to serve you. Whatever the cost may be, in this world, passing away. Down in the desert, up on the mountaintop, what he wants to do is test your faith and find it wanting. Satan says, you believe this stuff? Well, then prove it. It stands written. Here he is quoting God's own word at God's son. It's written. The angels will guard you. Just jump. Myself, I've never been tempted like that. <laughs> I am scared way long before we get to that point. But it's a very similar thing. 
when the devil starts whispering in your ear, you say you've got a father who cares for you? Is this the way he cares for his kids? Where is he now? Make him be your God. Force his hand. Can we still be God's children? Say, no, I believe what is written. I know you care, Father, because you so loved this world that you gave him also for me. Jesus teaching us to pray. It's not what I want. Take it away, Father, if it's possible. Don't do just what I want. Let your will be done. Let me rest there. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You see, there still is a purpose. When God is testing us, we can say, God, help me now to live it. If I'm really your son, if I'm really your daughter, I don't understand this cross, but let me follow Jesus. Let me follow him who goes to the cross. Let me follow him through the grave. Let me follow him to the Easter that must come. Let me follow him. Hold on to his word. To say this sermon really simply, the devil is not going to be happy if he just tempts you and you do bad stuff. It's something much more sinister than that. You can have a whole lifetime of bad stuff and still leave the devil very disappointed. Let me tell you about the story of this one guy. We don't know anything about him except that his whole life was a wreck. The only thing that the scripture remembers about him was that he was a thief. And yet the devil hates this guy's story. Because at the very end, this guy calls out, so Jesus, remember me someday after you get to your throne. And Jesus said, someday? Maybe? Forget it. Today, you are with me. You've got a new identity. You and me are together, he says to the guy. You are with me in paradise. You think the devil likes that story? Through the centuries, how many of us, thousands and millions, have taken comfort in this guy's story? Jesus is open in paradise to everybody, even to a bum as bad as me. Wow. You see, the devil is not going to be happy with himself if he just trips you up to do a few bad things. In fact, he'll be very pleased with himself if you go walking away and say, well, really, I'm not that bad. I do a pretty good life compared to most people. Then you believe in yourself. He tricks us. He sucker punches us. And then we can join the crowd. It's not about our good fight. It's about Jesus and handing the devil over to him, the only one who beats the devil. You're no longer part of the old family. You have a new identity. You belong to Jesus. You no longer live for your old sick self. You've got a new purpose, a new life. Even if it comes with the cross, it will be a marvelous life that will not only bless you under the cross, he will make you to be a blessing to others. Jesus, so often we fall for the old temptation. Let us let go and rejoice that for us we already have the victory in your nail-pierced hand. For us you beat the enemy. 
Whatever cross may come, Lord, let us remember our identity, that we are yours. Let us live with your purpose, that now and always we may praise you. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you, friends, as you win the victory that has been won for you, following our Savior. Amen. We've got a, a whole bunch of prayers here in our bulletin, and I want to add another one for um, Frank Moore's brother, Dick, is again um, struggling with cancer. And the prayer, when we put this thing together on Thursday, said that Jim Tipner was in hospice care and the Lord uh, called home our uh, Saturday night friend on Friday afternoon already. So I want to pray for his uh, daughter, Denise, and grandson, Danny, as they're grieving with us for Jim. Are there other prayers that you would like to add tonight? Hello? Yep. Janora. I have a great-granddaughter, Audrey, that uh, has aspiration pneumonia. She was just born this, this week in intensive care. Okay, newborn in intensive care. That is no fun. Yeah. Please, Tom. Please seek comfort for my mother, Eileen, who's 95 in the nursing home up in Illinois. Let's stand if we go to our good Lord.